A lot of politicians defend the Second Amendment by saying it is important for sportsmen and hunters. While this is true, the intention of the Second Amendment was to prevent infringement of citizens having the means to enforce their own self-defense, which is a God-given right, and to establish an armed public as the ultimate check against an oppressive government, foreign or domestic. Some say, well, that can never happen here. Well, in Germany in the 1930s, Hitler disarmed the population in the name of peace and security. At the time, the German people were highly educated, and they fell for this. They allowed it to happen. Another benefit of keeping and bearing arms is it deters crime. In Florida, after widespread concealed carry, crime went down. Multitudes of gun control laws which leave innocent law-abiding citizens defenseless against criminals who don't care about the restrictions actually increase crime. Another benefit is hunting. But again, the main purpose is self-defense and guarding against an oppressive government. Now this year, the Supreme Court ruled that the Second Amendment was an individual right, and that is a good thing, if not an obvious notation. However, they also said that reasonable restrictions may be allowed. This was a major mistake, because I guarantee the politicians have a very different idea as to what is a reasonable restriction. From the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, they drew reasonable restrictions allowed. Confused? Well, it's, what is even more disturbing is that this decision was five to four. This is deeply troubling. We came one vote from losing our most precious right. How is this possible? It is a glaring example of how far down the wrong path we have come. The four dissenters ignored the well-documented intentions of the Founding Fathers and said the Second Amendment refers to a collective right, which is nonsense, but of course we know, of course we know no such, there is no such thing as a collective right. Only individuals have rights. Such an abhorrent distortion of the truth and historical record seems to me like grounds for removal of office of four Supreme Court justices. So don't think the struggle with the Second Amendment is over. Not by a long shot. We must remain vigilant. Don't think for one second we can lay easy on this one. Guarding our liberty on this issue is paramount. Our next speaker is Dr. Michael Munger. He is the chair of the political science department at Duke University and also was the 2008 Libertarian candidate for governor of North Carolina. Please welcome Dr. Michael Munger. Thanks, I may seem a little bit fried. I just drove up from, uh, from North Carolina. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, the, I have a discussion fairly often with uh, law and political science scholars from other countries uh, at conferences or uh, 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 academic meetings. And the, the, the striking thing to me is the difference in the interpretation of what many legal and political science scholars, who otherwise seem, they're very well educated, they're certainly very knowledgeable of uh, the literature of political science, which may be a drawback or I think it's hard to say. Um, but particularly, the, the particular difference that I note most is between people who are, say, a, a law school in France uh, and uh, someone schooled in the legal tradition of the United States. The biggest difference is what constitutes the will of the people. If you ask someone from France, what is the will of the people, they'll tell you that it's embodied in legislation. Well, when I look at the Bill of Rights, I am convinced, and there's plenty of other evidence, but all you have to do is look at the Bill of Rights and you'll easily be convinced the framers of the U.S. Constitution did not believe that legislation was going to be the will of the people. In fact, I think that the simplest way I can think of, is, and I often put it this way when I'm making speeches, is that democracy is two wolves and a sheep deciding what's for lunch. Under no circumstances should we say that we're going to put a majority in charge of the rest of us. Why would anyone have the right to be able to tell me how to live my own life? Now, there are some things, there is, as Professor Lark said, there are some minimal requirements to be able to say, these are the rules, anyone who breaks, anyone who harms someone else, we're going to allow certain circumstances under which they might be deprived of their liberty or property. But due process, 
and evidence and a lot of care in exercising that really powerful uh, action of government is, 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 that has to be required. Well, when I look at the, the Bill of Rights, what I see is a skepticism of the actions of legislature so profound, I wonder what it is we now teach in, uh, well, political science departments or in high school civics. Because if, if you ask someone, is the United States a democracy? If you ask a school child, is the United States a democracy? Should it be a democracy? They'll say yes. And what it means by democracy is that we're all bound by the will of others. Well, the French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau asked a really good question in the social contract. And the question was, how can it be that man is both free and yet bound by wills not his own? How can it be that man is both free and yet bound by wills not his own? And then he gave the wrong answer. And we have adopted that wrong answer ourselves. We have adopted it by ignoring the contents of the Bill of Rights. We have adopted it by ignoring the fact that it's individual rights and the individual expression of political beliefs that are the key to the functioning of what we in fact are, which is a constitutional republic. We're a republic in the sense that there are a lot of restrictions on um, how we can act together, and we're constitutional in the sense that the Constitution, not legislation, but Constitution, embodies the will of the people. So this past year, um, well actually for nearly the past three years, I've been on the campaign trail campaigning for uh, governor of North Carolina, and I'll end the suspense, I didn't win. In fact, I came in third, but I did sufficiently well, that was after the Democratic Republican, if you were wondering. But I did sufficiently well that the Libertarians now in North Carolina are on, on the ballot for the next four years. We don't have to spend a quarter of a million dollars poured down a rat hole to try to get the darn signatures. And, and when, I, when I tell people about how difficult it is to get on the ballot in many states, or how difficult it is to stay on the ballot with a 10% requirement like you have in Virginia, these there clearly are constitutional requirements for assembly and petition that are being denied by the state legislature. I can't imagine any interpretation of your state constitution that would allow that 10% restriction to pass, except that the game is rigged. So when I was out on the campaign trail, what I found, and I'll, I'll, I'll close with this, what I found over and over again was when somebody asked me, well, can you summarize what it is you want? First I'll say, well, can you tell me what the Democrat wants? Can you tell me what the Republican wants? Both of them are running on some version of the platform, vote for me and I'll give you other people's money. Well, that's not my platform, it's something rather different. What I would like is a government small enough to fit inside the Constitution. And the box that the Constitution is, is constructed of is the Bill of Rights. Thanks for listening. Yeah.